In this video, you're gonna learn how to design the printed circuit board layout for your very first custom microcontroller board. We're gonna be using the open source software KiCad and the board that we're designing is based off the schematic circuit diagram than I did in my previous video. So if you've not seen that, you may wanna check that out. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is in the schematic editor, I'll do update PCB from schematic, and it's just gonna randomly place all of our components in the printed circuit board layout editor. And now it's just a matter of me moving the components around to place them in the positions that I want. So all I'm doing now is trying to put some of the passive components next to the chips that they support. And then also like, you know, R5 and D1. R5 is the current limiting resistor for D1. Same with R6 and D2. And these LEDs can be placed anywhere. So I'll just put them over to the side for now. Brought over R3 and R4, which are for the USB. C2, we got near U1. Now I'm bringing C3 down to the USB connector. Okay, we got our reset and our boot switch. Now in this video, we're keeping things really simple, but if you wanna see how to expand this design by adding a bunch of extra features, then you can find the link to this expanded design in the description below, which includes both the expanded tutorial video and the design files. These are just the, R's, the resistors and capacitors that go with our reset and boot. We're just gonna move that over here. So I'm not laying out this board with space optimized, you know, because for a tutorial, I don't, I don't wanna get lost in details of trying to make sure that everything is like minimum spacing. It takes a lot more time when you're designing a board to be as small as possible. You can't just, you know, you can't have dead space between things. You have to pretty much pack everything to the minimum spacing, which just takes a lot of measuring and adjusting and just more time to do. So that's something to keep in mind. If your design is really small, the small size is critical. It's probably gonna take you more time to finish the layout. Now I'm just routing the data lines for the USB. There's a differential tool in KiCad that allows you to do differential pair lines. It's a little bit finicky to use in certain cases. So for something this simple, we can just draw them each as individuals, but we'll keep them close together. So they basically are still a differential pair. We're just not using the diff pair tool. You know, there's a good amount of stuff that goes into designing a differential pair or specifically the data lines for USB, especially if you're gonna be really high speed or if if you're gonna have a long routing traces. And I have a separate video that you can watch on that where I go into detail just on designing uh, the differential pair for USB data lines. For this design, we're using you know, relatively low speed USB and the distance that we're routing these lines isn't too far. So I can get by with a little bit less strict adherence to the differential pair and to the impedance of that differential pair, which is also critical that I go in, in detail in that other video. So now all I've done is just I've connected up capacitor to the five volt supply coming in off the USB connector. And now because of the USB-C, there's two pins of everything, so you have to connect those together. So now I've just connected the two 5-volt USB pins. Now I've connected the two USB minus, or the negative on the diff pair. What well, can be a little tricky sometimes with this USB-C is getting the two sets of the diff pair lines connected together. My D minus was blocking my access to connect up to the D plus, so that's I'm redoing that now. And now I should be able to, yes, now I can get my D plus connected to my other D plus, my two N minuses, uh, USB, the negative differentials are shorted together. And then we have the diff pair that goes up to the microcontroller, although the one line I've not connected all the way yet. Okay, so we have our differential pair. Keep in mind to do a diff pair properly, you know, you need to calculate the impedance and that's gonna be determined, you know, by the, the spacing between the two lines. For this, I'm keeping it simple. I don't wanna go into all that detail. And for this, like I said, there's another video where I go into the how to do this correctly. Okay, now I'm just connecting up the two resistors, the CC1 and CC2, which are the two 5.1K ohm resistors that you tie to ground, which are essential if you're using, you know, USB to power your product, you need to have those two resistors set to ground. And I'm just going to move this one over here where I can maybe get to a little easier. The other CC, which is on the other side of my diff pair. Now this is our linear regulator, which is taking our 5 volt USB supply and stepping it down to 3.3 to power the microcontroller. If current was going to be much higher than it is for this design, you know, if this was linear regulator was going to have to step down 5 to 3.3 and supply hundreds of milliamps or 
maybe an amp or more, then you, you almost likely would want to use a switching regulator for that. Linear regulators are best if the input to output difference in the voltage is low and or if the current through it is low. It's all about the power dissipation. Linear regulators are super simple to use. They're super clean. They're not noisy, but they can waste a lot of power in certain situations. And in those cases, you would want to use a switching regulator, which is quite a bit more complicated, but is a lot more efficient in power usage. Okay, I'm just getting my LED and it's current limiting resistor connected. Then Q1 is our infet that we're using to turn on this LED, which isn't absolutely essential as long as you keep the LED current below whatever the GPIO pin on the microcontroller can source or sync. Then you can just you know drive it directly from the GPIO pin, but you can also use a transistor to drive it, and then that way there's no loading on the microcontroller GPIO pin itself. Okay, I'm just moving the 5 volt USB capacitor. I just wanted to move it over to this side to give me more space on the other side and just beefing up that trace. Even though the minimum trace size that I'm using is sufficient for any of the current that we're going to be supplying on this design, but I always like to over design a bit on power traces and just increase them more than what's necessary. So now I'm just going to route power from the 5 volt USB to the input of the LDO. And I'm just using a trace for this, not a copper pour, which is what I would typically use on a design if there's more significant current flow. I tend to prefer copper pours versus just a trace. And a copper pour is just basically a big shape that you can draw in the design, and then it will just fill that in. So instead of it being just a line, you could draw a big square or odd shapes to connect things up, and it's just a big block of copper. Okay, and there's our reset and our reset switch. And we just have our pull down resistor R1, which is on the boot, which will normally keep the boot pin low. And then let's connect that up to the microcontroller boot pin. So now I'm just connecting my LED up to the 3.3 volt supply. And you'll see I had to do a via to the bottom side to be able to cross that trace. And the 3.3 volt supply for our boot switch so we can pull up the boot pin. And once again, I'm keeping the power routing simple in this design. I'm just using traces to connect everything up, especially because I'm just doing a two layer board. Normally on a more production quality design, I tend to prefer four layer boards and then have one inner layer that's just a ground plane and then maybe one layer that's just power. And then that way you don't have to have all these power traces. You can just basically via down to that power plane and then power anything from that power plane. But for this design, just doing a two layer board is gonna be the simplest. It's gonna be the cheapest. If you can get by with two layers, that's gonna save some money, especially if you don't have things like RF. If you do have RF, then I find it's a lot more important to have a four layer board, especially in regards to passing certifications. I mean, it's really important for RF to have a really nice ground plane that doesn't have a lot of like broken pieces in it which can act like small antennas and give you emi headaches when you're trying to get it certified now i'm just going to connect up my infet my transistor here just got to via down to the bottom layer and you can't connect the bottom layer to a part on the top so now i have to via back up to the top layer and now i can connect to that pin tap off the 3.3 supply through the decoupling cap and then to the pin is generally the way you want to do it. You don't want it to route to the pin and then to the cap. So all I'm doing now is just drawing the board edge and adding a ground copper pour. So you can do the copper pours on the internal layers, but you can also do them. And generally a good idea to do it on the external layers. And it will just basically create ground copper pours, ground copper, you know, wherever you don't have traces or pads. It will just fill in those areas. But you want to make sure all those areas are definitely tied to ground and not just pieces of copper left floating. So I'm just setting up my copper zone here, also called a copper pour. Just saying it's set to ground, connected to ground, setting like the spacing and the minimum width sizes for the copper pour, which is important when it's filling around the, the various other components. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to fill it so you can see. And there you go. You can see it just filled in all the areas that don't have traces on that particular layer. You can see there's 
there's some areas where it didn't put a copper pour, like right here, this big blue area that you're seeing the, the bottom side. That's because it would have created an island, a copper pour island that didn't have a ground connection. So it didn't fill that in. That area is totally surrounded by traces. So, But what we can do is put the copper pour on the bottom side that's ground, and then we could put that island in and then short that to the bottom ground, and then it wouldn't be an isolated island anymore. Okay, let's get these. Can't have the reference designators off the board. That doesn't work very well. Okay, here's our board, what it looks like in 3D. Looking good. We got all of our components. Don't really have anything on the back side except two traces. And now what I'm doing is adding the vias to each of the components that need a connection to ground. And then that way it can connect into that copper pour that we just put on the top layer. And where there's a good ground, it needs a ground connection. I'm just going to add a bunch of vias. And then when we refill that copper pour, or that copper zone, it will automatically connect up to these vias because they're both tied to the same net, which is just ground. And there are plugins that you can use for KiCad that will add these vias for you in a lot more organized fashion than me just randomly placing them, but this is also sufficient for a design like this. The higher the power, and if you have RF or anything high frequency, then having a lot of ground vias is gonna uh, tend to be more important. Just putting a lot of good grounds here on the ground plane or copper pour that's around our differential pair. We need some for our, our linear regulator here. There we go. There is our finished PCB layout for the simple version. So in this video, I've kept things really simple, but if you wanna see how you can expand this design by adding a bunch of extra features, including flash memory, a color display, a battery charger, an accelerometer, a motor controller, an IO expander, and a lot more, then you can find the link to this expanded design in the description below, which includes an expanded tutorial video and the design files. And if you found this video helpful, then you could check out the, the first part of this video where we designed the schematic circuit diagram. Or if you want something a little more advanced, then you can check out this video here.